Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy, creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Sorry folks, our guest today had to cancel at the last minute. Therefore, we have put together a composite of parts of past programs. Is that the U.S. and North Korea have remained at a state of war since the Korean War. I, I don't know how many people realize that the Korean War just had an armistice which stopped the fighting, but there was never a peace treaty signed ending the Korean War. So the war, in a sense, remains um, unconcluded. Up until, I would say, the early 90s, neither side was really particularly interested in engaging the other side. Um, the U.S., beginning in 1958, brought nuclear weapons onto the Korean Peninsula in violation of the Armistice Agreement, uh, threatened the North Korea with, with nuclear attack long before North Korea ever had nuclear weapons. Uh, in the 1970s, the U.S. began war games with South Korean troops and then eventually even Japanese, um, simulating uh, both a repulse of, of a North Korean attack or, or, or an actually offensive attack in, into North Korea. So there's been I guess a, a steady buildup of the U.S. threatening the North and then over time the North responding by threatening mm -hmm. to launch strikes on, on U.S. bases yeah. in the South or Japan and the United States. So it, it's been an ever escalating set of, of threats and counter threats. Yeah. The South Koreans have outspent the North Koreans on military spending every year since 1976. Um, in most cases, the North has been reacting to the fact that it faces an economically and militarily superior South and the United States, and that it's lost the protection of the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. it, the um, international agencies that actually measure military spending um, said as of 2016, the total North Korean military budget was $4 billion. South Korea is $40 billion. And then, of course, you have U.S. support for South Korea. And North Korea does not have any ally in a military alliance like the former Soviet Union. That's okay. not China. That's not Russia. So for the North Koreans, what you hear is that they spend a huge percentage of their budget on the military, which is true. They have a small gross domestic product, and they have no big powers protecting them. So they spend a lot of their budget on the military, but the actual size of their military, leaving aside the number of people they have, what they actually spend, the actual amount, is very small. And almost all of their missile tests, um, they've launched, uh, exploded five nuclear bombs, uh, 2006, 2009, 2013, and two of them in 2016, have come in response to either threats or what they have felt, and I think the evidence suggests, are uh, a lack of good faith bargaining on the, on the part of the U.S. So I think if you understand a little bit of the history of what's happening, and you can see that the North has been essentially the weaker party, um, has been responding to big military builds up by the South and the U.S., the loss of a partner, and the fact that, that a war still goes on, um, it, it paints a very different picture of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beginning in the early 90s, the North Koreans suddenly wanted, for that very reason, a different relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. They understood that without reconnecting to the global economy, the future of their economy was going to be very bad. Um, so what they began to do is to reach out to the United States and say, let's sit down and talk and settle the, the Korean War, sign a peace treaty, let's normalize relations, let's make it possible for us to get investment, to join the IMF, to join the World Bank. You know, we talk about North Korea as if it's this hermit kingdom that mm -hmm. it doesn't want to have any talks, it doesn't want to have any connections. And in fact, since the 90s, the North has been trying very hard. The North um, tried to join the IMF and World Bank to get aid. The U.S. and Japan blackballed them. Uh, the North has set up a series of free trade zones trying to attract foreign investment. U.S. and Japan haven't normalized relations. They won't allow any investment. They try and keep other people from, from investing. Um, 
So what's happened is since the early 90s, the North Koreans recognizing the economic problems have said, we've got to somehow get the United States to sit down with us, talk, settle differences, everything can be open. And so while since that period, the North Koreans have been eager and open to have those kinds of dialogues, the U.S. has been the exact opposite. They see the North as in a weak, vulnerable situation, and their goal has been to try and essentially destroy the economy, to try and maybe recreate what happened in Germany where the, the South can absorb the North. And so they have done everything they can to keep the North isolated and weak. And it's in response to that policy that the North Koreans have embarked on a nuclear program and a missile program. But at each step of the way, they have said to the U.S., if you will sit down and talk with us about all issues, your concerns and our concerns, we are willing to freeze our nuclear program. I think that, you know, the starting point is, do we really want to risk war? Um, we say, well, we can't, you know, we can't deal with the North because they don't want to talk, when in fact, they very much do want to talk. And it's really the United States that doesn't want to talk. Exactly. The right. U.S., in fact, refuses any direct negotiations with North Korea. And this didn't start with Donald Trump. This was under Obama and under Clinton. Um, so this has been a, a, a consistent pattern. And, it, and, and this is why some people say, well, it, you know, as long as there's no war, it doesn't matter. Who, who, who cares? Mm -hmm. Well, the situation matters in the following way. There's a squeeze on North Koreans leading to great uh, social cost, a malnutrition and difficulty. The North Korean economy is starting to grow again, but very slowly. Um, you know, mentioned the economic difficulties, they're real. Um, so there's a huge social cost in North Korea. But to the extent that the U.S. keeps this pressure on, uh, the, the warships, the, um, the, the, the still annual war games where simulated nuclear attacks are, are, are practiced, um, what that does is it's actually feeding militarism throughout East Asia. Uh, the Japanese are saying, well, if there's this big a threat, we need to end our peace constitution and have a strong yeah. mm -hmm. militarism. And then the Chinese say, well, if, if the Japanese are militarizing and the U.S. is doing this, we need to beef up our military. And so what it does is it legitimizes a big military budget in the United States, which we mm -hmm. don't need. It comes at the expense of social cost. Donald Trump wants to add $50 billion to the military budget cut. The same thing's happening in Japan. The same thing's happening in China. North Korea is, is squeezed because of its need for the military. And I don't think people appreciate that in a period of war tension, even if we don't have war, it provides an excuse for governments, whether it's North Korea, South Korea, Japan, China, to suppress democratic rights. Mm -hmm. Because any opposition to the regime can be seen as threatening national security. So w even if we escape a war, the policy has huge costs. And it's a policy of choice. If the U.S. wanted to sit down and say, OK, let, let's talk, let's, let's see what there is, they have a willing partner on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that option that the U.S. says we don't even want to entertain. It's in part a fact that U.S. Pop people say if there's an opportunity to, to minimize the risk of a war, mm -hmm. why shouldn't we take it? Mm -hmm. Which is a very reasonable it's thing. It's a very reasonable thing. And I think people take that not even knowing much about the history. And I want to get into a little bit more of that, but mm -hmm. I say what people can do, I think, is go, for example, to websites like the Korea Policy Institute that I work with, uh, which is kpolicy.org. There's another great website called zoomincorea.org. And you can see uh, and learn about campaigns that are going on in South Korea that people in the U.S. are trying to support. Um, for example, the U.S. is pushing a missile defense system on South Korean people that they don't want it. And the purpose of that missile defense system is to strengthen the U.S.'s ability to monitor missiles in China and, and Russia, although they claim it's North Korea. The North Koreans don't like it. It adds to tension. Mm -hmm. Those of us who don't like militarism in the United States should see that there's an option to you know, with pushing better relations with the North. There's ways to support people in the South. There are campaigns that are going on here that they can learn about and support.
Well, let me say a couple of things about the public banks. What well, they are not, they are not a public. A public bank is in the model of the North Dakota Bank. Uh, that's a state-owned public bank in which all of the deposits, all of the tax revenues, all of the fees and parking, tech, you know, the fees and the penalties, all go in by law, goes into their bank, and they and they use that bank as the depository for all the state's receipts. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the state of North Dakota doing business as a bank. So, uh, now this, the state model is one thing, but state banks, uh, public banks could also be created on the city level, or the county level, or created in a regional sort of a way as well. And the idea, simply, is to keep your money at home and invest in yourself. And, the idea, and so it, it, it starts to re-support the notion that the local economy has its own integrity, and its own wealth, and its own objectives, and instead of sending your money off to Wall Street and let them speculate in Brunei, let them, you know, let the equity, the assets of your community be used to finance the needs and the desires of the community. So a public bank is not, as, as we envision in any way, it's the North Dakota model, but I think uh, this is a, that's a, a very successful one because that's 96 years old. Uh, is not a commercial bank. That is to say, it doesn't make you, won't make you uh, a mortgage, it won't give you a mortgage, it won't give you uh, a car loan, you don't, they don't have ATMs, they don't have branches. They essentially, in our model especially, they do not compete with local financial institutions like community banks, credit unions, savings and loans. Where the competition that we envision and that uh, is we're, we're the strongest prospect and the most desirable prospect is that the creation of public banks will push back against the global banking interests, which we collectively call Wall Street, Wall Street banks, which have really been running roughshod over our society and our economy uh, for a long, 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 long time. Uh, as you know, money and power are pretty much synonymous. The politics uh, derives from the money influence and, and the money connections. Uh, so there is a there's a point to this that has to do with democracy and our, and our governance that's very important to consider because when you look at America you realize that we don't have a democracy here. This is an oligarchy. Princeton, pretty much uh, in Northwestern, I think had that one new study about two years ago and said, "What you know?" <laughs> yeah. Well, the last 40 years, you look at the will of the people and you see how much that gets reflected in public policy. And I like to said, there's no statistically significant indication that anything that y'all want shows up in the law. So, uh, and that's certainly, now that's the, the icing on the cake, or at least the, the surface appearance. Uh, so we have a problem. We have a real banking problem. We have a, we have a problem with uh, governance being tied to money and the consolidation of money and the continual stream of, of uh, capital development and, and profiteering becoming in the hands of fewer and fewer people which, of course, undermines the great wealth of America, which, uh, and the, the middle class, and the, the diversity of our economic system. We've all been pretty much reduced down to a level of debt, sort of debt slaves, you know? Now, that is kind of at the cusp of the problem about our money system, that, uh, that we have to pay interest on every dollar that we borrow. Uh, and it's interesting because that is the franchise that makes banking so rich. Uh, compound interest is this extraordinary device, as you guys probably know, that you know over a period of years you, know, you can pay three, four percent on or five percent of your mortgage, and then the price of your house suddenly doubles in a period of thirty or forty years. That's true for municipal borrowing too. So when we borrow money uh, to pay for infrastructure or pay for anything, uh, if we don't come up from it with our out of tax money and out of the money that we have uh, in a municipal level, uh, we have to go to Wall Street to borrow it in bonds. Now this is the this is the point where I'd like to we'll focus a little bit later on uh, in this discussion about um, what we can do to reclaim our democracy or at least give ourselves a chance in what little time is left to get our hands on the levers of uh, of our democratically based policymakers. And, and governance uh, by holding on to our money and creating a device, a new device that allows us to actually build a mechanism for growing our wealth instead of continuing going to borrowing more money and going into more debt and having more taxes out of debt.
talked about municipal finance, and I'll just say briefly about that, that if you were a, a treasurer, a city treasurer, county treasurer, or whatever, your, your choices, your ability to fund things is really limited uh, in a couple of, uh, to very bad choices, essentially. If your budget will not sustain the need to repair a bridge, and most city budgets are, don't, because they have to be balanced uh, at the end of the year, and they probably didn't budget for that particular bridge. Let's say it's a $50 million bridge. They don't have access to that in their budget, so what do they do? The, they can do, what can they? They, have, they can go into more debt, which drives taxes up, or they could sell some things, which is a terrible idea, because you know, as you sell off the public wealth, the public assets, especially to privatize it, that diminishes the overall equity and assets of the base. They can cut services to us all, you know, cut police, fire, and all that stuff. They can fire people. Those are kind of the five principal options that, that the municipal financial managers have. So it's a cycle of debt, taxes, debt, taxes, debt, taxes. All of a sudden, the public banking prospect shows up on the horizon that reverses this 180 degrees. And that's what's so cool and exciting about it and why there are 50 initiatives around the country to create public banks. Many of them doing very well. We're coming right over. We've been working on this for about five or six years, five years, six years, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and we are now seeing uh, developments in, in Santa Fe, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, uh, several places in, uh, in California, Arizona, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The list is quite, quite long. These initiatives being basically people in their towns who have gotten the word, seen the picture, uh, you know, seen what the thing is and say, look, you know, let's stop paying, uh, let's stop paying our money to Wall Street, keep the money at home. were quick to see that the city had these larger plans. They wanted to eliminate open reservoirs. Corporations who'd been involved in um, outlining all of the projects, which the Water Bureau has followed basically for a 25-year period, they had visions of not only burying reservoirs, but building all these treatment plants that uh, would introduce chemicals. So we've been working for 16 years on trying to preserve our open reservoirs. We obviously haven't been <laughs> successful in the end, um, but now the big fight is over uh, building a chemical adding filtration plant okay. for our Bull Run water system. Right. And so in those, what, 16, 17 years, the city now has no open reservoirs that are used for, for, for storing water, yes. uh, and we have covered reservoirs. Yes. Talk just for a moment about the problems of covered reservoirs. Well, there are a lot of problems. As I said, the open reservoirs, they get the natural UV light and disinfection byproducts that are a part of the treatment process. Those are dissipated through the open reservoirs. And during the periods when we use the lower quality Columbia South Shore well field as a backup, uh, we're getting radon, naturally occurring radon from the well fields. That used to vent through the open reservoirs. But now that we don't have those, think about that. Every time you use water in your home to take a shower, cook, um, you know, drink water, you've got, and they're using the well field, now you have radon oh. floating through the air in your home. So they served a lot of great purposes, and plus they were cleaned twice a year, so anything that would get into the reservoirs would be removed. Now, with just buried tanks over at Powell Butte, and they're gonna, uh, bury a tank, a tiny little tank up at Washington Park, demolishing two of the city's uh, most significant historic resources. Um, now, those tanks aren't cleaned uh, but for every five years or seven years. And there are openings and pipes throughout the system, so when a rat gets in that tank, it's there for five to seven years, rotting away. Uh -huh. In Portland, they've spent $440 million to reduce in-town storage mm -hmm. by 50 million gallons. It's really shameful. So we're wasting this $16 million. We, we didn't like UV because it introduces mercury to our system, but compared to filtration, if you had to waste money, and that's what this is all about, wasting money, let's waste the least amount. That would have been $100 million and the filtration plant could be upwards of $500 million. 
500 million dollars. Okay, and they've already spent, you said, 400 million. On the reservoirs. On the reservoirs, okay. Yes. And um, I, I, I wonder how much, if we went back to the uh, beginning of the formation of your organization, I wonder how much money they have spent um, oh. pursuing this. <laughs> yes, an incredible amount of money. And, you know, in the beginning, of course, no one in the public knew that the Water Bureau actually worked on crafting this regulation. It was only through public records requests that we uh, came to see that they had sent their revolving door consultant, who's now, he's been a revolving door consultant for 20 years. Mm -hmm. They sent him back to Washington, D.C. with a Water Bureau employee to sit on a committee to help craft this regulation. Because and this was, the e this was an EPA? EPA. Right. It okay. was, and it was the result of this filtration plant failure in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was the impetus, that was the basis for this regulation. And, and sadly, over the years, even though there's been all this new research that shows that all of EPA's estimates of problems they were going to avert have been wrong. Oh. Their modeling has proven wrong city after city across the country. Unless you have human activity or domesticated animals in your watershed, uh, you're not going to find infectious cryptosporidium. All of the significant events have involved human activity or domesticated animals. Uh, animals like Baker City, the Water Bureau will bring that up. Well, sadly, they had cows in their watershed. We don't. Ours is a protected watershed, and it's just a, a very sad thing because we're going to create problems with a chemical filtration plant, not mm -hmm. uh, protect our water. Mm -hmm. yeah. And corporations pay less in taxes in the state of Oregon than every other state in the United States. And yet we are at the bottom, we are rock bottom in terms of what percentage of, of our revenue we're collecting from corporations in the state. Which is also why a lot of other people in the state feel I'm overtaxed. Mm -hmm. If you undertax the corporate community to the extent that, that Oregon does, um, then you're going to get people feeling that Gee, I'm paying a lot of taxes already. Um, but in any case, that's what Measure 90 said it would have done. It would have, it would have solved the two big problems we have, which are we are in desperate need of more revenue. Um, we can talk about why. Um, and it would have done it by finally collecting taxes from the people who, quite frankly, have, been, you know, have, have not been anteing up. Um, unfortunately, the voting populace was bamboozled by a $28 million campaign that the business community put into mm -hmm. to defeating right. Measure 97, and they confused enough voters so that it was voted down. Yeah, and I, I, I think that figure made it the most expensive initiative campaign in Oregon's history. Yes, the opposition paid more to defeat this than, than we've had for any ballot measure in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. um, the state government is so starved for funds, largely because corporations have been paying their share. Wealthy people and corporations are very smart about taxes. Um, they take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much understand what their interests are. The amazing thing is how often the rest of us do not seem to understand where our just regular old personal interests lie. Fallen victim to sort of two great myths that corporations and sort of the media that sponsor the, their think tanks have managed to propagate, which is, oh, well, corporations are the great job creators. And if a state taxes corporations heavily, they will leave the state and, you know, they will take their jobs elsewhere. Um, and the other myth is resistance is futile. Mm -hmm. That if you tax the corporations, they will simply raise their prices and they will pass this on to the consumer. Um, the first thing to notice is those two things can't both be true. If they really did, if they were really able to go ahead and pass it on to the consumer all the time, well, then they wouldn't have to move out of state, would they? Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that there is no correlation between how heavily states tax corporations and prices in the state or employment in the state. I'm concerned about freeway expansions because we all know, as anyone that lives in the Portland metro region, that congestion is absolutely miserable. Our economy is growing, more people are moving here, and 
people are having a really difficult time getting to their jobs, getting to their kids picked up from daycare, from all of these different things. Uh, and in our community, we are seeing longer and longer commute times, and it's having a significant strain on our quality of life. Uh, and unfortunately, the isn't, there isn't a single example of anywhere in North America in which a city has expanded a freeway and made congestion better. Hmm. So if we are actively looking at this from the what are the problems our community is facing and how do we solve them, it is absurd to be talking about expanding the freeways. It is a 20th century idea to solving our problems and it won't work. We have decades of empirical research from urban planners. There's this concept called induced demand and it's very counterintuitive. I know a lot of folks think, man, if only there was an extra lane, then all of these cars wouldn't be able to be slowing me down. The notion is, is that the easier you make it to drive and the more lanes that you build and provide for opportunities for folks to take an automobile, the more people decide, oh, there is an extra lane there. I guess I will drive to the Lloyd Center during rush hour commute. <laughs> the problem is, is the next lane you build isn't going to be the lane that stops getting filled with cars. So us at No More Freeway Expansions PDX, uh, we wrote a letter to the city of Portland in particular concern to the proposed Rose Quarter Freeway Expansion that the Oregon Department of Transportation, ODOT, and the Portland Bureau of Transportation have been proposing and working through, um, specifically saying this is a solution that has never been proved to actually solve problems anywhere in North America, and we have grave concerns that we should be spending $450 million on this proposal when there are so many other more cost efficient ways to spend that money that would be more equitable, more better for climate, better for air quality, better for public health, and better for building a prosperous economy for, for the next generation. From an economics 101 perspective, we could invest hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and we have. The entire country has, cities mm -hmm. have. And never once have we been able to solve that insatiable demand for free freeway space during rush hour. So our group is saying, taking those similar principles of supply and demand and also keeping in mind all the significant negative externalities that comes from people having to rely on single occupancy vehicles to get their basic chores done, why don't we look at other more cost-effective solutions that include congestion pricing and put some of those resources, the $450 million, that's half a billion dollars for one tiny stretch of freeway when we have no belief that it'll actually solve the problems they're proposing. Okay. With the cancellation of our guest today, this has been a composite of past uh, parts of past programs. We will be back again next week with a new guest, and we hope that we'll see you again uh, then. Bye.